We generally rely on external knowledge from evidence and anecdotes to make training decisions. However, our own internal sensations can provide us with useful information too, which can help to enhance our training. In this video, we will cover how to use this internal feedback to improve the hypertrophic stimulus. The first sensation we can use to guide hypertrophic training is the mind-muscle connection. This refers to the feeling of contraction in the target muscle we experience while lifting. Simply feeling the mind-muscle connection doesn't automatically result in greater muscle growth. However, we can use this sensation to indirectly promote a superior hypertrophy stimulus. This is the closest study I am aware of which somewhat looks at the influence of the mind-muscle connection on muscle growth. 30 untrained men performed barbell curls and leg extensions for 4 sets of 8 to 12 reps with all sets taken to failure 3 times per week for 8 weeks. Half the subjects trained with an internal focus where they were cued to squeeze the muscle, while the other half trained with an external focus where they were cued to get the weight up. After 8 weeks, both groups saw increases in biceps and quadriceps muscle thickness. Although the biceps saw greater increases in thickness with the internal focus, while both quadriceps muscles experienced similar gains in both groups. So although it is speculative and it is only one study, it could suggest that exercises which have a high susceptibility to technique deviation, like free weight curls in this case, might benefit more from an internal focus. This might be because focusing on the mind-muscle connection indirectly promotes stricter lifting technique. Whereas exercises which have a low susceptibility to technique deviation, like leg extensions in this case, might not benefit from any specific attentional focus strategy. This might be because technique can't change much for these exercises, so regardless of the attentional focus, technique is the same. So in practical terms, we might want to focus on contracting the target muscle of the exercise for certain movements. Specifically, exercises where there is less stability and a high potential for technique deviations will likely benefit most. This includes exercises like split squats, bicep curls and rows. Whereas more stable exercises where there is less potential for technique deviations may not benefit as much. This includes exercises like leg extensions, leg curls or chest press machine. For example, this could be applicable for an exercise like a seated cable row. It will likely be beneficial to focus on contracting the mid-back muscles while lifting. This will likely help us actively protract and retract the shoulder blades during the lift, which is the role of these muscles. This might help us to produce movement primarily using the back muscles and ultimately help them train closer to true muscular failure. The second sensation we will discuss is the pump. This refers to the short-term swelling we experience in the trained muscles. It is not entirely clear at this stage, but it has been hypothesized that the pump can be beneficial for muscle growth via its ability to promote metabolic stress. This review article explored the potential role of metabolic stress for muscle growth. It was proposed that metabolic stress might stimulate muscle growth via a few different mechanisms, such as increasing fiber recruitment and promoting a release of anabolic hormones. Although once again, this is speculative at this stage, not something that is well established. Furthermore, it is unclear if metabolic stress is more of a result of muscle growth or something that is actually causing it to occur. Whatever the case, this is all mechanistic evidence which isn't as practically relevant for us lifting in the gym. What is more important is the fact that the pump seems to be positively associated with muscle growth. This was seen in this study, which explored the relationship between muscle swelling and hypertrophy. 22 untrained men performed leg extensions for 3 sets of 8 reps, 3 times per week for 6 weeks. Before and after the first training session, muscle thickness of the quadriceps was taken to assess the acute changes in muscle swelling. After the first training session, subjects saw an immediate spike in muscle thickness due to swelling over the following 15 minutes. And after the 6 week training program, the rectus femoris, which is one of the quadriceps muscles, saw an average of around a 3% increase in thickness due to muscle growth. When looking at the individual data points from each trainee, it was found that there was a positive correlation between acute muscle swelling and long-term muscle growth. In other words, those who experienced a greater pump generally saw better long-term growth. So, while it is unclear at this stage whether the pump actually contributes to muscle growth or not, it does seem to have a positive association with muscle growth. 
This suggests that feeling a decent pump is probably a good indicator that you provided a good hypertrophic stimulus. So we can use this as a way to assess if our training is effectively training the muscle we are trying to target. For example, let's look at pull-ups. If you find that the lats feel pumped after a few sets, it is probably a good sign. However, if you don't feel much in any of the back muscles, but instead your forearms get more pumped, then maybe they are receiving the majority of the stimulus rather than the back. So a solution here could be to use a different grip, use lifting straps, or try training in a different rep range. The next sensation that can be useful for hypertrophy training is soreness. There are two types of soreness that can be used to guide training decisions, muscle soreness and joint pain. First, let's discuss muscle soreness. This is when the muscle belly feels tender to touch and tight when stretched. This often occurs in the following days after a workout where a muscle was trained with significant volume and or intensity. But what is muscle soreness an indicator of? Well, soreness is a general indicator that a muscle was exposed to enough work that it caused a disruption to homeostasis. In other words, a disruption to its normal state. And as a result, we would expect some sort of adaptation to occur, which would ideally involve muscle growth. Although soreness is exacerbated with novel exercise. So we don't necessarily want to chase soreness all the time, because that would lead us to switching up our exercise selection and training routine too often. And changing exercises too frequently is probably not ideal for muscle growth. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of performing the same exercises versus changing exercises every workout on muscle growth. 19 men with at least two years lifting experience performed one of either the following lower body training routines two times per week. Half the subjects performed back squats, deadlifts, leg press, hip thrusts, leg extensions, and leg curls each workout while the other half performed three quad dominant and three posterior chain dominant leg exercises each workout too, but these were randomly chosen each session from an app. After eight weeks, it was found that both groups experienced significant increases in quadriceps muscle thickness, but the consistent training routine resulted in slightly superior growth for each quad muscle. So how can soreness be used practically to guide training decisions? Well, within the constraints of an effective training routine, soreness can be used to preference certain training methods. Feeling soreness in the muscle you were trying to target in the following days after training it is probably a good sign that you provided a good stimulus. And we can use this to make adjustments to volume, exercise selection, lifting technique, and so on. For example, if you find that dumbbell bench press consistently results in greater pec muscle soreness compared with the barbell bench press, then it might be a slightly better alternative for your anatomical structure. And the other form of soreness we can experience via resistance training is joint pain. This refers to dull or achy pain or irritation of certain joints or connective tissue. This might be felt while exercising, but also while performing other tasks throughout the day or even when resting. Joint pain typically presents gradually over multiple weeks and also takes a while to reside. And quite obviously, joint pain is not a good sign. It doesn't really have any influence on muscle growth directly, but it can inhibit our ability to train effectively and can inhibit everyday tasks. If you are feeling joint pain, here are some ways to try and mitigate it without sacrificing the training stimulus. Temporarily train with a lighter load and perform more reps for the exercises involving the irritated joint. This will provide an equivalent hypertrophic stimulus, but reduce the total stress imposed on the joints and connective tissue. Try changing the technique you lift with. It is possible that the technique you are lifting with might be placing excess stress on certain tissues. You can try changing exercises to a different variation that trains the same muscle group. Sometimes certain exercises don't suit our specific anatomical structure, but other variants do. And if none of these seem to be helping, you can simply reduce your total training volume temporarily until the pain resides. This can be achieved by simply performing fewer sets, fewer exercises, or fewer workouts per week. And the last sensation that can help improve training is the feeling of stretch. More specifically, we are referring to the feeling of stretch on the muscle during active contractions while lifting. Actively training a muscle under a high degree of stretch seems to be highly effective for muscle growth. There are a few different mechanisms which suggest this to be the case. 
First of all, intense stretching itself appears to be somewhat hypertrophic even in the absence of resistance training. For example, this study compared the effects of static stretching versus resistance training on muscle growth. 81 recreationally active men and women performed either a stretching protocol or resistance training for 8 weeks. Half the subjects underwent pec stretching for 15 minutes per day, 4 times per week while the other half performed pec flies for 5 sets of 10 to 12 reps 3 times per week. After 8 weeks, both the stretching and resistance training groups saw similar increases in pec muscle thickness. And while this doesn't mean we should all start stretching instead of lifting, it does suggest that intense stretching seems to be somewhat hypertrophic. And as a more practically relevant point, training a muscle when it is in a more stretched position appears to be especially effective for muscle growth. For example, this study compared the effects of training a muscle with different exercises which train the same muscle at different lengths. 14 untrained adults performed 3-5 to five sets of 10 reps of calf raises 2 times per week for 12 weeks with progressively increasing loads based on each individual's performance. One leg performed the standing calf raise, while the other leg performed the seated calf raise. The standing variation puts the gastrocnemius, which is the ball-shaped upper calf muscle, in a more stretched position on average compared with the seated variation. However, the length of the soleus, which is the flatter lower calf muscle, is the same between both variations since it isn't influenced by knee position. After 12 weeks, both the lateral and medial heads of the gastrocnemius saw significantly greater increases in muscle volume in the leg performing standing calf raises compared with the seated calf raises. However, the soleus experienced similar growth in both legs. So, the feeling of stretch during resistance training is probably a good indicator that the muscle is being lengthened. And if the target muscle is being trained in a more lengthened position, it is likely to be highly effective for muscle growth. We mostly use anatomical knowledge to influence the length we train a muscle at. However, we can use the stretch sensation to make subtle changes to lifting technique to improve the hypertrophic stimulus. For example, this could be used during an exercise like overhead triceps extensions. You could adjust your elbow positioning, torso angle, eccentric tempo, height of the cable and so on to achieve a high degree of stretch under load for the triceps. To summarize this video, let's establish some practical recommendations. While sensations aren't directly indicative of muscle growth, they are often somewhat correlated with muscle growth. They can then be useful as indicators to help guide training decisions to produce the most effective hypertrophy stimulus. The mind-muscle connection refers to the feeling of muscle contraction while lifting, and can be thought of as a good sign that the target muscle is highly active. The muscle pump refers to the feeling of fullness of a muscle due to swelling we experience immediately after it is trained. This is associated with long-term muscle growth and is therefore likely a decent indicator that the target muscle was sufficiently trained. Muscle soreness after training is an indicator that the muscle was disrupted to a significant extent. However, joint pain can hinder our ability to train effectively and can sometimes cause discomfort during everyday tasks. And feeling a good stretch in the target muscle while lifting is an indicator that the muscle is being lengthened, which is usually beneficial for muscle growth. So, we can use these sensations as indicators of an effective hypertrophic stimulus. We can manipulate training variables based on what we feel during and after lifting. We can make changes to training volume, intensity, exercise selection and lifting technique to try and achieve the best perceived stimulus. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.